No, just oh, uh, just just wanted to be like the proper one. It used to be here, right? It's not here. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, maybe you can introduce that jump here. Okay, I think we're gonna start. Um, we're extremely happy to have Patrick B visiting us today uh, from Stony Brook, and he's gonna tell us about his beautiful electronic vision of the future. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll try not to break anything else here. Uh, it's good to be back. I haven't been here since the pandemic, uh, so hopefully now that I'm here, I'll start to again come by sometimes. Um, so I'm going to tell you about electronic vision for the future. Um, this is mostly based on a lot of work that's happened in the last couple of years through the SNOMAS process. So uh, unfortunately, I didn't put the references, but there is a SNOMAS View and Collider Forum report. I was one of the conveners for that. And I'll also be taking a lot of stuff um, from the SNOMAS Higgs report, which I also, unfortunately, was the convener of. Well, fortunately. <laughs> Um, in any case, let's get started. So I'm going to start with a summary. So if you fall asleep through the talk, um, this is hopefully the takeaway that colliders are a most versatile tool to explore the shortest distances in nature, and a muon collider presents a new paradigm with almost unparalleled reach if we have the vision to invest in our future. So that's the summary. Now, for those of you interested, this is just started, unfortunately, <laughs> during my talk. Um, you feel free to nod off and raise at your phone. Unfortunately, I can't. Check the score during it. Um, Soup should allow a little window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you can be like looking really intelligent. Like, wow, my slides are great. Um, so, obviously, the question is if we're talking about future colliders, the, the first thing that comes to mind is aren't they enormously expensive? And many of you know that we have a collider currently running and running for a very, very long time still. So, the LHC uh, is currently running and it will continue to do so almost until the end of the 2030s at this point, possibly even slightly longer, depending on the politics of Europe. So the question is, where do you go from there? Um, if they take a lot of money and you know, they last for a while, why are we talking about it? Well, the LHC has already taught us an enormous number of things about the universe at the fundamental level. and the reason why I'm talking about this now, when we have a program that goes out till 2040, is colliders, unfortunately, because of the costs and how large they are, they take an enormous amount of time to build. Now, why do I say we need to plan now? So as everyone is hopefully familiar with, unless you've been under a rock for the last two years, snow mass has been going on for the last many, many years. Um, and this was the energy frontiers vision for the future. Okay, so this doesn't actually mean anything because this is just what physicists agreed upon as what the vision for the future should be. The funding agencies can have an entirely different uh, vision, but we'll come back to that. But the prioritization goes all the way out till almost 2040 in the sense that in the near term, obviously prioritizing the high luminosity LHC program. But the three new aspects in this first uh, five year period is establishing a targeted E plus E minus Higgs factory detector R&D program for the US for participation in global collider. I heard Michael Peskin was here recently as a colloquium, so you probably heard quite a bit about this. And the real novel thing that came out of the snow mass process in the energy frontier was developing an initial design for first stage TV scale muon collider in the US with a pre CDR at the end of this period supporting critical R&D towards EF multi-TV colliders. And then as you see, as this kind of time scale goes further and further out, it says support construction you know, for EPLUS. You may know what CDR stands for. Uh, conceptual design report. Um, then the hope is by the period starting in 2030, we're constructing some E plus E minus factory. 
and demonstrating principal risk mitigation and delivering this so-called conceptual design report for a first stage TV neon scale collider. And then last but not least, um, in this final section, uh, I'm matching a technical design report. And the real key to, I think, all of these that's different than everything we've been doing for the last 10 years in the US is what came out of the energy frontier is that we want to have a collider program back in the United States. Now, of course, this is just what came out of SNOMAS. Unfortunately, it doesn't mean any of this will actually be supported by funding agencies. And to give you a historical perspective of why we have to do all this physics studies ahead of time, the very first SNOMAS was 40 years ago. And in that first SNOMAS, they were envisioning their future. And they separated the world into hadron colliders and lepton colliders, kind of like we have nowadays. And what came out of this was they imagined that we should have a collider of hadrons up to 40 TeV. For those of you young people in the audience, you might not even know the fact that the US had such a collider plan, the superconducting super collider. Um, unfortunately, we never realized that. And we're still trying to get to 40 TeV more than 40 years later now. Similarly, we had this vision of lepton colliders 40 years ago. And in this study done by very famous uh, Physicists, uh, you see that linear colliders from about 400 GeV to 2 TeV were imagined back in SNOMAS 1982. These, both of these efforts dovetail very well into programs you might have heard in the modern day parlance, FCC at CERN and the ILC. However, both of these are still yet to be funded and yet to go in forwards. So this tells you the kind of time scale that we're talking about. 40 years later, we're still trying to realize these projects. So, I mean, this is what we're in. We'd like a new collider, but we're still not getting this collider yet. So we need to figure out a few things. So 40 years have passed. The plan has been updated a bit, but the question still remains, should we be doing the same things we've been trying to do for 40 years? Or are there new technologies? Are there new physics concerns based on data we've received, based on theoretical understandings that we could put forward and re-ask this question a bit? So I'm going to go back to a very basic point of view, and since I didn't know exactly what the audience would be, some of this will be a little bit more colloquium style, some of this will be technical details, and feel free to ask questions at any point. But what's our most basic point of colliders? Okay. At their most basic level, they're microscopes. Okay, We all know this analogy by going to higher energy, we probe shorter and shorter distances. And we have no problem imagining many, many future telescopes. Okay. Of course, everyone was concerned about cost overruns for JWST, but once it flew, that's gone out the window, and everybody loves the science pouring into it. Colliders are exactly the same thing. Unfortunately, we don't get to shoot them off into space and have all these pretty things that come along. So you could say, well, why colliders, though? Aren't there many other ways to get at fundamental physics and to understand nature and, for instance, maybe a lot cheaper and a lot quicker than waiting 40 plus years? So we have lots of examples of this. Um, so for instance, these are examples of G minus two where we had the hints, which probably doesn't exist because of lattice, but whatever you want to say from that, there's another approach than colliders. And we know that we can have tabletop experiments like EDMs that can go after these things and a whole host of cosmic experiments and whatnot. So we should pursue these things as well. Okay, I'm not in saying we should do colliders and not do any other types of physics, but we really have to understand that in any time we see a deviation, okay, because if you see a null result, that doesn't really tell you anything because as model builders in the room, we know we can always model build around a null result. However, if you see a deviation, you'd really like to test what's going on with it. And so even though many other ideas can get out way in front of our technological abilities with colliders, we still need to eventually understand how to get to those scales to directly and reproducibly um, test these ideas for what is the underlying physics. This aspect, though, I think is underappreciated. The colliders are also precision tools for many things simultaneously. We always talk about like the LHC found the Higgs and it didn't find anything else or something like that. But the analogy with telescopes is essentially one-to-one -one in the sense of we have this telescope microscope perspective and we say, look at the first JWST images, okay? We scan enormous distances and phenomena. We have from extragalactic to planetary to nebula 
to the ejecta from the asteroid from the DART mission. These are all the same machine gets to do all these things. Okay? Let's think about the LHC in terms of the varied phenomena and the varied physics that it's studying. It's not just about did we find a new particle. So here's examples of using top quarks to understand color correlations between the top quarks and how QCD really affects things and entangles things. Here's an example of doing electric physics on Z plus jets. Here's, of course, the famous Higgs result and Higgs of four leptons. We have B physics. We also have very different types of QCD regimes where this is ultra proliferal collisions where you have gamma gamma from the proton not disintegrating at all into process. So this really is kind of one to one in the sense that the collider is not just do we get to the shortest distances, we're covering a wealth of phenomenon and the costs may be large, but if you actually look at the scientific output in terms of number of papers, number of topics, it really essentially is as efficient as any other experiment. Now, the only problem is, of course, even though we have these beautiful ideas of colliders, why don't we have this same enthusiasm that we have for the next space telescope? Okay? The decadal survey puts out lots of ideas for new telescopes and new things, and everybody says, well, this is great. I hope we can fund all of these ideas. We don't have that same sort of enthusiasm class. So part of it, of course, is all of our pictures, unfortunately, are just histograms. We don't even get nice artist conceptions of things. <laughs> and unfortunately, the trend is going to even be, in some sense, more negative from your former colleague, uh, Kyle Kramner, right? Experiments are eventually going to be pushing to just publishing likelihoods. So we're not even going to get these nice histograms that we can do. Everything is kind of be like doing it on the data itself. Okay? But I hope to remind you all or convince you all that they really are these multi-purpose tools. So what collider should you build? Okay, so you're going to, you're hearing this from a theorist. So inevitably, I will once again ask you for more energy and more luminosity as a theorist. Okay, I had a lot of fun at SNOMAS talking to accelerator physicists, and they always were kind of like, oh no, he's talking to us again. He's going to want this. But it's an understatement um, in the sense that we're not asking for it forever. Sorry, an overstatement. Because we know that this is not a never ending tool in particle physics, okay? I'm sure for any of you that have heard a talk by NEMA, you've always heard this same analogy of, hey, we collide things together, we have this reductionist paradigm, we're looking at shorter and shorter distances, eventually we get to the Planck scale, we make a black hole, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we no longer have this Wilsonian paradigm for extending to arbitrarily short distances, okay? And a different way of saying this, um, Robin Sunder likes to point this as, we know that there is a tip to the mountain, right? We know that there is a place that we're going to get, which is the Planck scale. Okay? So obviously, we want to try to climb this mountain as much as possible. It's not going to happen in any of our lifetimes, but if no one starts, we're never going to actually get there. So we'd like to build the most powerful collider possible. And there's many ideas of how to build more and more powerful colliders out there historically and during the last few years. So, for instance, this is a, a beautiful idea by uh, Peter McIntyre uh, to essentially use the fact that colliders essentially have to be made watertight to deal with groundwater when you stick them underground. So why not make it really watertight? And then you don't have to worry about tunneling. So you reduce those costs so you can make it really big, not have to have gigantic magnetic fields so you can achieve high energies without the paying the price of HTS magnets and all these things. So this is an example of being a 500 TeV. A crazier version that came out by Zimmerman and Beachman over uh, the snowmass process was to stick a collider on the moon. And then here's an even crazier idea to stick a collider around the entire Earth. Now you could say, okay, we're just gonna get in crackpot land, we just wanna get to the Planck scale doing whatever we want. But the important thing to remember, this isn't just the domain of crackpot physicists, that picture of a collider, well, actually, this was a fixed target back in those days, going around the world, this is from Fermi. So this is Fermi's Globaltron idea, okay? So I'm obviously no Fermi, probably none of us in this room are Fermi, but in the sense of famous physicists that were not crackpots, this gives you an idea to dream bigger. So why is it 5,000 TV and not 14,000? So um, this one is scaling up essentially the magnet assumptions that he had and kind of ramping up. This is using different 
technology, but um, this was actually, as uh, Chris Quake pointed out, this actually would only be about uh, a few TEV if it was fixed target, uh, which is what Fermi had because they didn't have colliders when he first uh, posited this. Obviously, you could build higher than uh, 14, T 14 PEV. So Accelerator is used to have this Moore's law. And so if we want to get to the Planck scale, and we could keep this scaling, hey, not too distant in the future, 300 years ago, um, this little country was just uh, getting off the ground. So we can imagine continuing this pursuit. But the question, obviously, is more realistically, what are the interesting waypoints, and what is the current technology that we can play with to actually ask what type of collider one should build? So for the last several decades of collider physics, uh, there's been a, essentially a divergence in types of colliders. Okay? So you don't have to take my word for it. This is a review by uh, Vladimir Shiltsev, the leader of the Accelerator Center at Fermilab and Frank Zimmerman at CERN. And the point that they've made, which is borne out by all colliders we have, is that there's two different paths. You use Hadron colliders to get to the highest energies, which is what the LHC is, and in parallel, we can use E plus E minus colliders called particle factories to explore at much lower energy, but the properties of the particles and precision. So in the energy frontier, today's signal is tomorrow's background. For the accelerator frontiers, today's high energy is tomorrow's low energy. So this E plus E minus idea that you heard about from Peskin when he gave the colloquium is really what the focus is in the near term. The Higgs needs a factory, as Tao Han will tell you anytime you meet him. Um, but we need to figure out the physics other than this. But this is the basic idea. We should think of Higgs factors for E plus E minus, but we need to think about this high energy mountain that we want to climb. Now, there are many motivations for a Higgs electric factory uh, from different perspectives. The most basic difference of why you have this bifurcation into leptons and hadrons is, of course, that hadrons are composite particles, okay? They generate large QCD backgrounds, and you only use a fraction of the energy but you're able to accelerate them to very high energies. Leptons collide fundamental particles that exploit the full energy and don't have large backgrounds, but it turns out, as I'll talk about, are much harder to accelerate to high energy efficiently. Here's a quick visual level event difference between a hadron collider and a lepton collider that you probably saw in Michael's colloquium. So here's an example of looking for Higgs production and Higgs going to leptons at the LHC. And you see, you have an enormous number of tracks, energy deposits, et cetera, based on the environment of smashing essentially two trash bags of quarks and gluons and looking for this needle in the haystack that comes out of it. Whereas the same process, I mean, this is the kind of level that you say, you're an undergraduate, you found the Higgs, you're done at the level of E plus E minus clock. And this doesn't even reflect the needle in the haystack properties of the, all the other backgrounds. So there are many different proposals for these Higgs and electric factories, and there are visions that go beyond this to the highest energies using hadron colliders like FCC or SPPC in China. But now we'd like to understand, is this the only option and what are the timescales for these colliders? So this is from that same Schutz 7 Zimmerman review, and this shows this bifurcation into hadron colliders and lepton colliders in terms of the function of the center of mass energy and how they've been marching along in terms of the uh, time elapsed since colliders were first invented. The only depressing thing, of course, is you have to update this plot a little bit. Um, currently, right now, the plan for FCCHH is not to start before 2070. So if you really wanted to probe nature at shorter distances, I mean, I'm certainly dead. Maybe some of the youngest students in this will still be old people in 2070, um, but that's a little scary. So the question is, what are the other options? Okay, so there are a few other ideas out there other than FCC and CPC, SPPC, and that comes on these lepton collider plots. Um, so there is the possibility to keep advancing with these sorts of colliders in the shorter time scale. But what happens is there's inherently a wall that you always hit with lepton, with E plus E minus colliders. Okay? So all of these colliders down here, does the cursor show up there? These are examples of circular colliders, and they never kind of reach above, let's say, four to 500 GeV maximum. Okay? The reason for this is that in a circular collider, okay, you have a light lepton going around in a circle, it emits an enormous amount of synchrotron energy. 
So if you try to keep pushing the margins on getting to higher energies, what happens is the power consumption just blows up. This is essentially a wall for circular colliders of E plus E minus as we know of right now. This already exists at LEP. LEP was a circular collider as well. LEP's beam energy, when you got to the highest energies, was already kind of losing 10% of the beam spread by the highest energies, okay? Going beyond this is almost impossible. Linear colliders have the ability to go to higher energy because you don't have the synchrotron radiation from going in a circle. There are issues of so-called beam strolling of when you bend the beams at the end, but the highest version of a linear collider that we have right now that's practical in any way, shape, or form is CLIC that reaches up to about 3 TeV. This costs the same as FCCHH, uses more power than FCCHH. There's essentially a wall with linear colliders. So the question is, are hadrons and waiting till 2070 the only option that we have to explore nature at shorter distances and we just kind of put it off for a few generations? Or are there other paths? So the question is, what if there is another collider out there that you could reach high energy and you could do it more quickly and sustainably? So this is what I'm going to talk about for the physics case, that there is a possibility that in the kind of 2040s to 2050 range, there could be a version of a lepton collider that gave you all the physics results I'm going to talk about, and it could be done in a more sustainable package than hadron colliders. So it turns out there are potentially two paths forwards if we wanted to have a higher energy lepton collider. So one could be figuring out, can you get linear colliders above the 3 TV mark? And the only way to do this would be to have a paradigm shift on E plus E minus and use a different type of acceleration, okay? We're essentially dictated by the maximum gradient that superconducting cavities can have right now. That's of order, let's call it 100, uh, MV per meter, um, and we just essentially would have to build a gigantic machine if we want to go further. So Wakefield technology has the promise that you could potentially make a much smaller collider that was cost effective and get to higher energies. The problem is the power consumption is still through the roof, so it's very hard to get luminosity in these. Focusing the beam is still not understood how to do this with a Wakefield accelerator. We have no idea really how to do this for accelerating positrons, so we can't do E plus E minus colliders. And there's really no real design to assess physics potential yet. Okay? And in particular, the CERN Laboratory Directors Group put out a report um, last year saying that in their esteemed eyes of all these famous accelerator physicists, there's absolutely no way that we're going to have a Wakefield accelerator before the time scale of FCCHH. And remember, time scale of FCCHH is 27. Right? So, it's a super interesting technology, but it's not promising in the sense that we can't evaluate physics and we don't have a way to build it. The only other option is to do something crazy and use muons instead of electrons. So why do we want to talk about muons? So the power loss in synchrotron radiation scales like the fourth power of the energy compared to the mass of the charge left in unit and scales with one over the radius. So essentially, we can build circular colliders bigger and bigger and bigger, but of course we can't build them arbitrarily large unless we get to kind of Fermi global trend scale. But the nice thing is this first part of it depends on the lepton mass. So the ratio of the muon to the electron is about 200. So you get about a factor of a billion in terms of reducing synchrotron radiation at the same energy scales. Now, what that means is you can go to high energies with muons, and you can do it with very small r, okay? So you can build a compact circular collider at high energy. This is exactly the same reason we use protons for high energy, because you don't have to deal with the synchrotron loss. But the point is, muon colliders can also be much smaller than hadron colliders, because you're colliding a fundamental particle rather than this bag of quarks and gluons, okay? You can pack all the punch of the energy in one thing. The only hitch, of course, and why a muon collider has never been built before, is that they only live about two microseconds. Whereas a proton, with the current bounds on proton decay, they live at least 10 to the 47 microseconds. Okay? So you have a lot of time to get your protons into shape, but muons, you need to do something to magically turn this into a frontier machine. So there are conceptual plans for muon colliders that were developed in the US by the muon accelerator project, Fermi Lab, that unfortunately was killed by the last P5. 
And what they did is they came out with a full design report for a potential muon collider from Higgs Factory Energies to multi-TEVs. And they're very different than the normal collider designs that you might have seen, because it's all driven by the fact that you have this really short-lived muon that comes along the line. Okay? So I'll give you kind of a toy version of this for theorists, because I mean, maybe none of you have already seen like what the LHC complex looks like, so uh, this might kind of fall into ears. But the basic idea is first we need to somehow make the muons. Okay? Now. It turns out this is actually a benefit for muons compared to electrons, because one of the, the leading idea for this is we'll take a lot of protons at very high power, and then we'll smash it on a target. And what will happen? You'll get QCD scale interaction, QCD strength interactions, making lots and lots of pions. Luckily, because we all know from the uh, spin flip from pion decay, pions like to decay to muons. Okay? So we get lots of mu plus and mu minus. Okay? This is a, actually a hard part of electron colliders because it's hard to make very strong positron sources. So you can make mu pluses and mu minuses very easily if we have a very strong proton driver and we have a target that can withstand the beam. Okay? The beams that we're talking about are order multi-megawatt beams on target. Now the problem is if you make a bunch of pions that then decay to muons, what you essentially have is muons flying off roughly about this sort of scale. Okay? They're flying off in this sort of radius at um, the scale of energy, which we're talking about the GE scale when you're producing these things. Okay? So the first thing you have to do is you have to somehow collect all of these muons together very fast. You have to have the capture solenoid. You have to bunch them together, make nice bunches out of these. And then the big part is you have to do something that cools them. Okay? You have to turn a beam like this into a beam that's of order smaller than a millimeter. Now, there are many, this kind of ideas are essentially common to lots of different accelerator facilities. The problem is when you're making a nice beam, whether it's for material science or for collider physics, you don't have to care about how long it takes to cool the beam. Okay? So you can use synchrotron radiation, you can use laser cooling, you can use stochastic cooling. You got to do this with this two microsecond lifetime. So there is a new technology that needs to be put in here, which is called ionization cooling. Essentially what you have to do is the only thing fast enough is you need to pass the muon through some material, so essentially beta block formula, and that will make the muon lose some momentum in the transverse direction. And then what happens is you need to then accelerate it because if it loses energy, you need to accelerate in this direction, and then you're collimating the beam along this path of a cooling regime. Then you have to get it, there's many stages of this, eventually it's called final cooling, which gets it up to a collider level, and then you have to accelerate it just like any normal particle and collide it. Um, so this is the conceptual design for this. Now, muon colliders have often been thought of having a number of miracles that have to occur for a muon collider to exist, because this is new technology. However, it turns out that given the time scales of other projects, there now are all the individual pieces for a muon collider that exists in other types of accelerator facilities, colliders, and different sorts of experiments. So for example, the proton driver, we need to make all these muons, a lot of them to start off. Multi-megawatt proton drivers are in existence now and being built. These come at Spallation Neutron Sources, so SNS and ESS. We also use them at JPARC for muon beams, and we also talk about Fermilab. LBNF Dune is going to be a multi-megawatt proton driver. We need a strong target that can actually stand up to these things. Well, we already have those as well. TDK is demonstrating megawatt targets. LBNF can get 2.4 megawatt targets. The capture solenoid, this crazy magnet that has to withstand all this radiation, be about as big as my arm span and pull all these muons together. It turns out that both the field and the size are similar to the eater magnet in terms of the eater main solenoid in terms of aperture, which is something being built. Ionization cooling, okay, this is a new technology, you can't use the other versions of cooling, but it's been partially demonstrated in the mice experiment at Rutherford Lab, and it turns out if you want to kind of have the most, the last step of cooling, you need a very strong field magnet with a small bore, and the original map designs was a 30 Tesla with kind of an order centimeter bore. At the National High Field Magnet Lab in Florida right now, 
a magnet such as this already exists that users can use at the National High Field Magnet Laboratory. And last but not least, for the collider ring, you need high field dipoles, and that's similar to what already exists for HLHC. So still more R&D needs done, but it really, we have no miracles that have to occur. Furthermore, it turns out this is also the greenest collider for a number of reasons. Okay? So this comes from the implementation task force of the Accelerator Frontier and Snowmass. And what this is looking at is this important ratio of luminosity to power. Okay. So we all know from quantum mechanics, if we want to go to higher and higher center of mass energies, what do we have to have? We have to have more luminosity because cross sections fall off with the center of mass energy squared. Okay. But the question is, can you provide that luminosity without having to essentially take all the power supply of New York City or something like that? So this is an example kind of showing the physics I already talked about here, where these are lines for circular colliders, which unfortunately drop like a rock in terms of luminosity or power as it increases in our mass energy, because that's synchrotron loss. Linear colliders are roughly flat um, in terms of if you look at the ILC and click lines once you get to kind of the TEV scale. That's these blue curves here. These yellow curves are Wakefield, and you could ignore them. These were what came from the proponents, but um, the Accelerator Frontier, the experts, put this airband to say that we have really no idea what this is. Okay, so Ignore the yellow for a second. Neon colliders, though, have this unique feature that as you go to higher and higher energy, they become more and more efficient in terms of luminosity per power. Okay? There's a number of things that enter into this. This comes from the fact that it's a circular collider, how you cool the muons. And of course, what's obvious, if I go to higher and higher energy, I have a longer lived muon. Okay? So they thrive at high energies in that sense. Why is there an inflection? Isn't it just like constant slope going up? In terms of this? Yeah. Um, so it really comes down. I, so unfortunately, that's why I don't write a single formula for this, that in terms of the actual design of like what comes out of the cooling versus how these things are accelerated, um, we're trying to get our accelerator colleagues to kind of come up with the nicest, simplest explanation for this. But at least in simulation, um, that's why, for instance, the air bar that the accelerator community put on this is not inflated so that they believe the trend, but in terms of the actual values. So it becomes more efficient for physics at highest energy. So we have the best luminosity of our power and it's more compact. We can build it much more compact because we don't have the synchrotron loss and we get to use all the energy instead of protons. So therefore, in terms of thinking about building and cooling contributions of CO2 emissions, it's the greenest collider version of this. It also, because we have this effect of growing luminosity over power, it turns out that to do the physics only takes an incredibly short amount of time. Run plans for muon colliders are five years, compared to LHC that's running from 2010 to 2040, okay, where FCC programs were also of order 20 years. So as Fabio Maltoni likes to call muon colliders, these are space-time compact colliders. Okay? They're small in space and short in time. Now, of course, this is a little fantastical. You say, why aren't we already building one of these? Um, you say, maybe this is some technology that needs to go off for 2070 or 2100 or something like this. So it turns out that the experts in the accelerator community don't actually think that there's any miracles involved here. This is what came out from the CERN laboratory directors group. So like DAISY, CERN, all the various European labs, they put out an accelerator R&D roadmap for the future as part of the European strategy process. And this was endorsed by all laboratory directors, which says you could have a neon collider in the early 2040s if you put in the R&D investment now. Furthermore, something that I'm sure nobody in this room is too versed in is the fact that there's actually lots of applications for muon beams outside of muon colliders. Okay? So you might have already heard about muon imaging. Like I remember maybe probably half a decade ago or something, you saw like the pyramids in Giza were imaged using muons, right? They use the muons that can penetrate through. And so imaging is kind of a, a nascent field for this, but there are applications using imaging for nuclear reactors. Um, our government likes it a lot. Uh, just this fall, there was a DARPA solicitation for building compact muon beams uh, that flipped the Nito sent to me. And it turns out they're also interesting from the perspective of materials physics as well. Okay? 
So kind of like M NMR, you can kind of use muons for spin relaxation, and they give you properties that doing this with other beams don't. Okay, so for instance, you can essentially think of this heuristically as if you have a muon captured, okay, now when that muon decays, you're going to get, in terms of the x-rays that are going to come out of this, the light that comes out of it, is much higher energy, so you can actually probe materials much more deeply than you can using conventional techniques. Okay? So there are lots of applications to muon beams. So I prattled on for 40 minutes about a very non-theoretical level of this. So muon colliders are awesome, but what is the physics reach and how higher energy should we go? So I'm going to go through a lot of physics quickly, and please ask me as many detailed questions you want about any of these things. But let me give you kind of some frameworks for how to think about this. So the first one is how high of energy should you go? Okay. We've been developing physics cases for future colliders for 40 years, and a lot of, um, at least some of us in this room, were the last snow mass process and talking about when Nima brought out the 100 TeV Chinese collider, we did lots of studies for that. And everybody's now familiar with uh, FCCHH and roughly the physics case. Here's an example of trying to think about what the difference between a lepton collider and a proton collider is. We can use the concept of parton luminosity. How many partons are available at a given center of mass energy? And protons, of course, well, you have the PDF for the proton. You don't get to use all the center of mass energy of the proton. So here's a very rough idea of comparison where if we factor out the partonic cross-section, and we think about what is the parton luminosity available such that we get the same rate of production, then these two curves, the blue and the orange, are for if you have a quark-initiated process or a gluon-initiated process at a hadron collider versus a mu plus mu minus process at a lepton collider. And what you see here is, if I take, for instance, a 10 TeV muon collider, I would need roughly a 250, GE, 250 TeV proton collider to reach the same parton luminosity okay, in terms of its reach. Gluons, of course, it's a different slope because there's more and more gluons at a hadron machine. And this is to make the comparison kind of even more fair, where if we make the cross-section ratios reduced by a factor, for instance, if I'm producing some QCD-dominated process, the production process at a hadron collider is direct, Whereas at a muon collider, if I'm trying to produce something in QCD, first I have to emit a photon that splits to quarks before I can talk about it. Or, so this gives you ratios and kind of this. But the point is a 10 TeV muon collider, which is what is currently thought to be doable in the projections, easily goes beyond a 100 TeV collider in terms of this very basic part on the velocity. Now this is not the limit. As I said, this is just what people think is doable in terms of design studies already. And part of the R&D program should be finding how high it can really be pushed. Now, this is really just kind of a basic idea of parton luminosity. Let's think about actually the physics reach of these things. So if we want to build a foundational physics case for colliders, obviously the zeroth order thing we should always think about whether it's a telescope or a collider is the unknown. Yeah? Now, unfortunately, uh, especially the DOE doesn't like just to use the unknown as a motivation to give us millions and billions of dollars. So we'd like to spread this case out a little bit. So for instance, we could think about Higgs physics, we could think about dark matter um, and other possibilities. The problem of course is the unknown doesn't set a scale. So if I wanna tell you how high energy, well not, I can't use that, but I can try to use some of the other possible physics motivations to this and it's hard to get a guaranteed return. Well, dark matter is a really great idea. Unfortunately, we have no idea whether it exists. So I'm going to start with the physical motivation of the Higgs and what you can do with Higgs physics. So the Higgs is always kind of drawn as a central figure in terms of where it exists in the standard model. But unfortunately, the Higgs also gets a bit of a bad rap in terms of it's also referred to as completing the standard model. Okay, we've done the standard model's over. Let's go on and prosper from there. But the centrality of the Higgs is enormously underrated in terms of all the different types of physics, both at the shortest distances and the longest distances that it potentially has complete control of. Okay? So at the basic level, we'd like to understand, for instance, the origin of electric symmetry breaking. But we also know, for instance, the Higgs is the lowest dimensional Lorentz invariant gauge invariant operator that we can write in the standard model. 
So the Higgs is a natural portal in other sectors. The Higgs connects both to the early universe and to the late universe, okay? The early universe, the next epoch beyond BBN that we think happens with the standard models they heated up is the electric phase transition. And that is controlled by measuring properties of the Higgs. Stability of the universe. I'm sure some of you remember when the Higgs was discovered, there's all these articles about, is our universe metastable, okay? And will it just poof and go away? Um, the Higgs is connected, of course, to naturalists. There's a quantum field theory issue associated with the Higgs. Is the Higgs fundamental or composite? Is it unique? And these other two questions, of course, people are familiar with the origin of masses as coming from the Higgs. But you also have to remember that the Higgs is also the origin of all flavor in the universe. Okay? We often talk about the CKM matrix in the standard model as what controls flavor. But if we didn't have Yukawa interactions, we could diagonalize everything in the standard model, and there would be no intergenerational mixing. Okay? So the Higgs Yukawas are the things that actually control the flavor. For any of our neutrino physicists that might be in the audience, I'm probably guessing not here, um, but um, one sneaky thing that we talk about, like Dune making Dune, all neutrino physics is Higgs physics as well. Okay? We don't think of it that way, but the only way for neutrinos to get a mass is due to electric symmetry breaking. So it either needs to couple to our Higgs, or what would be even more fantastic is that there's a whole other new source of electric symmetry breaking in the universe, another Higgs. So Higgs physics really is this super central phenomenon um, that controls everything that we're interested in. I'm going to um, page through a number of things here. I mean, I'm just saying this in words, and we can come back to it if anybody has questions. But essentially, all these questions, there's observables that you can correlate to these various things, whether it's, for instance, understanding the Higgs potential, and there you want to understand Higgs self-interactions, whether it's this future of the universe, and you want to understand, are there particles that couple the Higgs and eventually lead to another vacuum? whether it's the history of the universe and you want to understand the electric phase transition, right? We don't have any actual measurements from cosmology before this time or from particle physics. Everything's extrapolation, so we'd like to understand better. So we know this basic picture of everything heating up. It's in textbooks, and we can study it using high-energy colliders. But we also know there's other recent possibilities. For instance, uh, work with my former student, Hari Romani, we know that the universe could also be completely different in the early epochs, and it really depends upon understanding Higgs interactions better. The compositor fundamental question, okay, is it a pion or is it a fundamental scalar for the first time ever in the universe? We also would like to understand naturalness at the basic level, okay, in terms of do we have this picture of QOT flows described by Wilsonian normalization, which essentially says the Higgs should be the cutoff scale of our theory? Or are there other interactions? Okay. I'm just paging through this because I don't have time to slam many things together during your 1230 uh, talk, but I want to get to the results here. Um, naturalness, okay? One thing that's often underrated about models of naturalness is if you wanted to tame these quadratic divergences, essentially you're saying if I have a solution to naturalness, you also have a prediction for where the Higgs mass should live. Okay. This is why early on in the LHC, when we had the first hits of the Higgs, we knew that we shouldn't expect supersymmetry at the LHC. People hand ring now of not seeing it, but the natural scale was not the TEV scale. It was a much larger scale, unless you did a lot more model building. The Higgs portal, as I said, the mass of particles, flavor, blah, blah, blah. Um, in the end, there's lots of things that come to the Higgs. So what I want to show you now is some of the actual results for how you test these ideas. Higgs factors are great to test a lot of them, You've had a colloquium. We have a ready project. We should build it. Okay. I'm not controlling that, so I can't do anything. But to answer a lot of the questions that I also paged through very fast, we know that we already need to get more energy than the Higgs factors. Okay. You need to get more Higgses, and you need to be able to probe multi-Higgs processes. So to understand why you need more Higgses, let me give you kind of an order of magnitude to understand it. So at left the last E plus E minus factor of high energy, we were producing the Z boson on resonance. And the LEP had, collider had 17 million Zs across all the experiments. Gauge bosons are very democratic, egalitarian sorts of objects. Okay? 
Gauge bosons coupled with a gauge coupling, essentially universally up to the charges under the gauge symmetry. And essentially all the major branching fractions of the Z boson are order 1% or larger, okay? The Higgs as a scalar is kind of this dastardly opposite of egalitarian, where the Higgs depends upon new Kawa couplings as well. So the Higgs factories people are talking about right now are kind of order a million-ish Higgses, and that's why we needed it to get this famous Higgs to gamma gamma. So you'd have this branching fraction 10 to the minus 3, and you'd have about a thousand events to play with at a Higgs factory. The unfortunate possibility is we can't even have a plan to test the standard model completely yet. We say the standard model is done, but I have no idea how to test the standard model. Because if you think about the first generation, which is what all of us are made of, these branching fractions are at 10 to the minus 8. I can't even produce one of these events at a Higgs factor. So we need more Higgses to go after these things. And the general mantra is more energy is more Higgs if you can provide the luminosity. So from the kind of proton example, we know this because if I take a proton, I go to higher and higher energies, I get more gluons that are living at low energies from the QC splittings. And therefore I have more gluons to produce more Higgs. At a lepton collider, it works essentially the same way. At low energies, I can produce it through associate production of ZH, but at higher energies, this sort of VBF process starts to dominate and the cross-section increases. In particular, the cross-section in terms of associate production drops off with the center of mass energy square, whereas this essentially gets a log enhancement that comes at higher energies. It also turns out that if we talk about leptons at high energies, it's an entirely different paradigm shift to thinking about what are the actual colliding particles. We're always used to saying, hey, I have a proton or I have an electron. At high energy, what happens is because of the soft and collinear singularities of the particles you can produce from the leptons, these are becoming larger and larger effects. So you can actually think of leptons at very high energy as thinking of these as PDFs, like Hadron Colliders. You can think of a muon as having a W boson inside of it when you get to higher and higher energies. And that's kind of the same growth at low energies, at high energies for um, the protons. So this gives you a figure of merit for how many Higgs is at various different collider possibilities. As I said, you can kind of get an order of a million Higgs to a few million Higgs with E plus E minus ideas around. Now, the amusing thing is you can do a lot more Higgs precision than the LHC, even though the LHC has order 100 million Higgs by the time it finishes. This is the issue of backgrounds and dealing with composite versus fundamental particles. FCCHH would be the ultimate Higgs factory producing about 27 billion Higgses. Unfortunately, it's a proton-proton collider, so you have all these backgrounds coming along for it. But if you can get to higher energy lepton colliders, now you can kind of start seeing the scaling of this, where you can go from the millions to tens of millions to order hundreds of millions with a higher energy muon collider. So what does this give you? Okay, This is kind of a snarky version of how you summarize Higgs physics all at once. The basic idea is imagine all the couplings of the Higgses are free to vary by a so-called coupling modifier cap. So we have different kappas for the W and Z boson, gluons, photons, etc. All the particles that people need. The black part of this chart is what came out of the European Strategy Group. And what came after snow mass is essentially the same for these various colliders. Here's an example of if you had a muon collider at the highest energies, you really can do the Higgs physics at low energies with an E plus E minus collider with a 10 TeV muon collider or better. Okay. Now remember that any deviation in this, okay, we're not just caring about what the precision is. We're hoping to find new physics. Okay. If you have any of these couplings varying from the standard model value, the entire standard model breaks. You have perturbative unitarity violations all over the place. And so the question is, what scale does some precision imply about the couplings we want to measure? What, what, that plot, that's the uncertainty. If I say run the ILC at 250, then kappa W, I'll know it's within a factor of 1.8. Or... That's the ultimate precision, the 1.8. So, in terms of the. So, if it were 1.9, I could detect that. And if it were less than 1.8. At 1.9, I... you'd say it's a fluctuation. It wouldn't be discovered. But that's, but that's sort of. Exactly. That's the way you want to think about this. So, the way to kind of say it that's often said is that the LHC is kind of getting us to the few percent level. 
at the end of HLHC. And E plus E minus Higgs factories can get us down to the percent or sub percent level. Um, so you see kind of this level for the Z coupling and the W couplings. That's kind I'm of, not getting very well how to read it because 0.29 isn't percent. So say again, what? This is the precision that you can measure what, to. What do you mean, in precision? In percent. In percent. In percent. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. In percent. Oh, oh. This is the percent. Uh, sorry. That's <laughs> a very important thing to add to your. Yeah. yeah sorry. I just was cutting this. What about Higgs pole? So the Higgs mu and pole. Um, I could. Yeah. I can refer to that later, but it, it really doesn't do better because the luminosity, the same ratio of like kind of you see this luminosity or power increasing, it kind of is not that good at low energy. So. You don't do as well. But this is just kind of give you a very basic feel. But why is it so bad at copper T? So it's not a hadron collider. So glue glue to um, uh, TTH doesn't exist for the muon collider. So if you want to ask for, for instance, VBF production or drawing M production of TTH, it's just a lot smaller cross section. You can think about other novel methods using kind of the Higgs without Higgs EFT program where you use perturbing unitarity. That was in um, a paper that Isabel and I were on the Muon you know, Smashers kind of using just TT bar production, and you can kind of get to sort of percent level there. This is just um, kind of using single Higgs only. Sorry, I know I'm flashing these things fast because I wanted to kind of give you this four pi version of this, but yeah, we can come back to this um, in more detail. But what I want to emphasize is that the Muon Collider also can give you something different, okay? So whatever the physics causes the deviation, we know that we've integrated out some new physics to think of this as a low energy effective field theory with some coupling deviations. So if you imagine what are the size of these deviations, you can say, well, do I exchange something with the Higgs at tree level or do I have a loop level process? And you can play this game to understand what does percent or per mil precision actually gain you in terms of the scale of new physics that you're probing. And if you set couplings up to order one, not four pi, just one, you see that you roughly are probing this TEV scale with Higgs precision if you can get to the percent to the or to the per mil level. The remarkable thing is this is new states that are coupling the Higgs or electric charge states at the TEV scale. If you have a 10 TV muon collider, you can see all these states simultaneously. So unlike this paradigm of building a factory and then building a collider after it to maybe search for the deviations, a muon collider is an all-in-one machine for electroweak and Higgs physics. You get the single Higgs precision, but you also can test the deviations at the same time. Furthermore, you can test the Higgs potential in unprecedented ways. So this is the uncertainty on kappa lambda, the triple Higgs coupling in percent. Percent, um, And as a function of a 10 TV, 14 TV, or 30 TV muon collider, clicking at you about the 10% level, FCCHH, if we live to see it, um, we'll kind of get you this level. But a muon collider, as you see, gets you better and better precision than even this monster 100 TEV machine. I'm going to flash a couple other quick physics results just to show you the breadth of the program. So this is an example of thinking about the Higgs portal to other sectors. Okay, so this is essentially imagine an H squared S squared operator where you have some new scalar S. Okay, now you have the ability to ask, for instance, when the Higgs gets a VEV or the S gets a VEV, you can talk about the mixing between these two states, which we can parameterize by this mixing angle sine squared gamma. And then, it of course, depends upon the reach, the, what the mass of this extra scalar is. You can map this basic plot to many different things. They said whether it's a Higgs portal, talking about the electric phase transition, if you have a stronger phase transition in the early universe. You can even map this to ideas like neutral naturalness. Okay? What you see here is that in the simplest extension of the standard model, which this represents and covers lots of physics, the HLHC lives up here. This is kind of the parameter space we can test of how something couples the Higgs to the Higgs portal. Okay? Remarkably, if we have a 100 TV clutter, of course, we're going to get the same sort of behavior and we're going to increase the reach a lot. Once we start getting to the tens of TEV scale for a muon collider, though, because different processes come in for a muon collider, you can now essentially blow away everything FCCH could do if you get up to 30 TV, and 10 TV is really probing a complementary region. Another example is what if the Higgs was composite? So 
we used to model build lots of composite Higgs. It's something the community has kind of rallied around via Bertazzi, Pomerol, and others is kind of thinking about this minimal composite Higgs, where we think of it's um, dictated by two parameters, the scale of the composites, okay, this M star, and then we imagine that the composite sector has its own self-coupling, this G star, how these composites couple. You can do a power counting to say, how does this show up in terms of an effective field theory at low energies? And people have been using this as a canonical example to show how much you can test a composite Higgs. HLHC lives over here, FCC, and all the various lepton colliders here. Okay? What's remarkable is FCCHH, even though it has 100 TeV, is essentially dwarfed by the reach of a muon collider at 10 TeV. And this really shows, again, how even though this simple part on luminosity argument says, like, hey, I can transfer, like, a 10 TeV to 100 TeV, depending on the physics process, you can really go well beyond 100 TeV collider with a 10 TeV muon collider. Another example of naturals and supersymmetry some of you might be familiar with. Here gives an example of the reach. Um, roughly, the reach is half the center of mass energy. Okay? It's a clean environment. You can use it. And so, for example, here we can probe 10 TeV is kind of the magic number in terms of understanding Higgs at 125 GeV in supersymmetry. And you see, obviously, well, if I had a 20 TeV muon collider, I could easily test up to this infamous 10 TeV number that some of you may be familiar with. Of course, if you build models, typically you have electric enos or sleptons at a lower scale, so you really don't need to get to 20 TeV. A 10 TeV muon collider essentially has the ability to test all the kind of models that people have written down for the Higgs mass thus far in supersymmetry. Whip dark matter. Okay, this is another very interesting perspective from particle physics. Lots of people, know, I mean, everyone in this room knows that we've now expanded the possibilities for dark matter, and people start talking saying we have 90 orders of magnitude or something like this. Okay? Whip dark matter, of course, is still a, a live idea. Um, in terms of the Higgs eno, we know as simplest ideas or just having representations of SU2. But it's very hard, okay? Xenon and ton will not reach Guinos or Higgs Enos, okay? Future Tarankov telescopes and existing ones can start saying bounds on these things, but there's an enormous amount of astrophysical uncertainties. And for instance, Tracy Slatier did a projection for the CTA telescope, and it's not even clear that the CTA will be able to test the Higgs Eno hypothesis at 1.5 TeV. With a collider, you can just directly produce these states. So this is an example of covering the thermal relics for a Wino or Higgsino that everybody probably has heard at one level or another that you can do with a 10 TeV muon collide. So you can probe the heavy WIMP scenarios with the muon collide. Sorry, what was the thick and the thin uh, bars? This, um, this is using displaced vertex versus using um, kind of like photon plus missing energy. So the thin one is really what matters. Uh... I mean, both of these can, I mean, like if you take, for instance, uh, the Higgsino thermal target at 1.5 TeV, kind of like both of them are covered for um, 10 TeV. The Wino, you need the displaced vertex um, for the Wino to reach it for 10 TeV. But um, what's happened actually in Snowmass, what we've done is done full sim on a muon collider. We've done, kind of, this is Lian Tao, Zhen, and Tao Han that made this plot. But there's now been a full sim of this for the International Muon Collider collaboration, and you can achieve it with this kind of displacement vertex search. What are the subscripts in the left column? Um, Dirac fermion, Majorana fermion, complex scalar. Real scalar. What about the famous five flip? <laughs> Sorry, what? The five flip. Mr. Mulek's. Oh, um, they actually have in the paper. Um, it, obviously, with higher representations, you get actually easier to see many things, but where the actual thermal target goes yeah, after goes further. Yeah. So there's been an enormous number of physics studies done over the last few years, whether it's heavy neutral leptons that talk about neutrino mass, axions, 2HDMs. A lot of work was done uh, by like Yanni Khan, David Curtin, and uh, Gordon on G-2 inspired models, leptoquarks from all the flavor anomalies that we've seen in B-physics. Um, there's been a lot of work in terms of PDFs and factorization, this new way of thinking about high energy leptons. I actually don't have time to cover all of these. Um, and there are even many people thinking about ancillary experiments like beam dumps. And one of the papers discussed in the Journal Club was testing LE minus LMU and LMU minus L tau. Okay? Um, a group at Harvard 
thought about how you could actually do this testing L mu minus basically any gauge lepton number with a mu on beam dump. There's so many things I've given you, so you're not going to remember all the individual results, but I want you to kind of take the takeaway of what is the physics that allows you to do this enormous physics program beyond FCCHH in this new type of collider. All of the results basically come down to thinking of leptons and protons as PDFs. Okay. If you take a proton and you ask, what is the constituents of the proton? We know we have valence quarks, we have C quarks, we have blue ones as well. And what you see here is that even the valence quarks, they kind of peak around X of 0.1. You don't get to take all the center of mass energy of the machine. Lepton colliders, we're all familiar with the fact that you get to use all the center of mass energy of the machine. So for instance, here is the muon and the neutrino essentially peaking at X of 1. But compared to low energy lepton colliders that everybody's thought about before these last few years, you also get this long tail of all the particles of the standard model that let you do all these cool physics studies covering all these various different center mass energies. So the point is the muon collider is so powerful because it's peaked at higher X, but you still get to examine physics at all skills, scales, and you have a much cleaner collider environment. So that's why the mantra that we've been using is that this new type of collider at high energy is essentially a collider that can bring everything together. One collider rule them all. Instead of having energy and precision always living as two different types of colliders, high energy muon colliders can actually do the job for everything together. So I'll conclude, I mean, as I said, unfortunately this was a, just a scan of many, many different results and bringing people up to the basic idea. Um, I don't mean to diminish Higgs factories in any way. I think the Higgs particle is the most interesting particle we know of in the universe, and we need to study it to death. It's an absolute travesty that we discovered it 10 years ago, and we still have no plans for another collider to examine it in more detail. Okay? But that's a separate topic. Muon colliders, though, allow us to understand even more about the Higgs and an enormous range of other physics programs, axions, HNL, supersymmetry, Higgs physics and different regimes that you can't cover with Higgs factors. Okay? They are the most interesting microscope I think we have that we can potentially build. But the important thing is it needs R&D funding right now. Okay? The CERN LEG timeline that said we could have a muon collider by order 2040, okay? that's based on investing in it now. If we don't invest and we stay, for instance, in the U.S., wait till the next P5, we keep, keep kicking the can by kind of quantized 10 years. So it's up to us as a community to figure out how do we actually convince funders to put the investment in now. And it's not just the physics program. I really want to stress this. As we think about colliders of the future, we're going to have to have a paradigm change eventually. We can't keep building bigger and bigger. I mean, maybe Fermi has enough vision that he could imagine a collider around the Earth. I'm still imagining until the world is more peaceful, we're still going to be building colliders within a country and probably not colliders that span from like Texas to New York or something like that. So we need to think of a paradigm shift and we also need to think about the resources these colliders consume. And as I stressed, the Muon Collider is the greenest collider that we can come up with right now and it has a timeline that can be in your lives. And the one thing I didn't have time to cover at all, and feel free to ask you about this, I personally think this is the most logical future for U.S. high energy physics. Okay. There is an international muon collider collaboration that's based at CERN and has European funding right now. It's certainly a plan B for CERN at this point. But the U.S. naturally has the starting point for a muon collider. This idea of a proton driver and a target as making all the muons, that's exactly what we're spending all the HEB budget on right now in the U.S., LBNF do. Once LBNF turns off, we have this infrastructure at Fermi Lab, what are we going to do with it? We have a natural dovetail into it with the muon collider situated at Fermi Lab, and there are site filler designs that can get to 10 TV at Fermi Lab. You don't have to build a new thing in Texas or something like that. Moreover, we always kind of factorize in our field. Hey, I'm a cosmologist, I'm a neutrino physicist, I'm a particle physicist, or something like that. Anytime you have lots of muons, you have a crap ton of neutrinos. And therefore, there is enormous synergy between neutrino physics and muon colliders that we can exploit and kind of go forwards and kind of the most community unifying thing. 
So that's the end. Now we'll wait to see if anyone decides to fund it. Um, but one thing, because I've talked to Ken and Isabel a lot today about this, um, I would encourage you that the P5 process is undergoing right now. And there's a lot of weight from the Department of Energy of how that process is going to turn out. But there is time for community input. Okay? You might have already done a lot with SNOMAS, but P5 is the thing that matters. They're the ones that are going to drop our budgets. So there will be a town hall at Brookhaven early next year. Or if you're not here, there's also going to be town halls at Fermilab, LBNL, and SLAP. I strongly encourage you to have your voices heard because I think not enough of us in this room, for those of us that are around for the last P5, had our voices um, coming up in this process. And for those of you who would like the U.S. to have some future other than just doom taking the entire budget until 2040, you have to put in the work now. So thanks. This is a little inside baseball -y, but do you know who's on P5 and whether they are uh, Muon friendly? It was just released last week. Um, I'll be, I guess, slightly tempered in my response on video recording. Um, oh, yeah. But we turn that on? Yeah. <laughs> I can turn it off. <laughs> yes, the P5 is a wonderful organization. <laughs> full of great people. That will only create sensible decisions. <laughs> Where can I, where can I find those? Um, the last, if you search heat meetings, um, at the last heat meeting last week.